Hi guys, this is Ijaz Khan and uh, welcome to the second day of uh, P2P sessions for March 2022. Can you be, guys confirm uh, that I'm audible to all of you? Great, so let's wait for a couple of minutes before I start the session. Meanwhile, uh, if you people have any uh, questions, any queries, you people may ask me. Well, I have set up a Google Classroom and uh, for the time being, we'll be using Google Classroom for all our communication. Assumptions of EAQ. May I know what is EAQ? And what do you mean by the assumptions of equivalent annual cost? It's simply uh, a method that we use for uh, for comparison uh, for comparing um, replacement cycles of uh, comparing different replacement cycles. I'm writing my WhatsApp number on screens. You may note it down. That's my WhatsApp number. Noreen, I, I have discussed it uh, in my previous class. You can always watch it again. I have also uploaded the link on the Google Classroom as well. Elza, once uh, these uh, the session is over, um, after the end of this P2P session, since I'll be in contact with all of you uh, through my Google Classroom and probably will be having a WhatsApp group as well, uh, I'll be in touch with all of you. I'll, I'll be giving you people a plan of how you should be preparing in um, uh, for your exams once the, these sessions are over. So I'll be sharing that plan as well with you. Yes, uh, Hamza, you 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 can access Google Classroom and the link of the Google Classroom and the code of the, the Google Classroom will be shared shortly. You can uh, join that Google Classroom and you have the access to the previous lecture as well. 
uh, Osama, yes. If you have any question, you can just simply post on uh, the Google Classroom. Uh, either me or any other your uh, fellow will respond to it if anybody else also knows the answer to that query. So I guess uh, uh, more and more people will be joining. Uh, so let us. Start the session now. Well, I have got some technical issue. Uh, let me rejoin again. I've got some technical issue. Okay. Now it's fixed now. So. Well, uh, in the previous session, uh, somebody requested uh, that we should be solving a question or, or which involves working capital as well. So here we go. We have got a past exam question, Darn Company. Uh, this does involve uh, uh, adjustment of working capital along with inflation as well. So let us uh, go through that. Uh, calculate the net present value of the investment project in nominal terms and comment on its financial acceptability and calculate the net present value of the investment project in real terms and comment on its financial acceptability so we have to calculate it twice so the project let's go through the question don company has undertaken market research at a cost of 200,000 in order to forecast the future cash flows of an investment project with an expected life of four years as follows sales revenue costs these forecast cash flows are before taking account of general inflation of 4.7 percent per year the cost of the cap the cost the capital cost of the project payable at the start of the first year will be 2 million the investment project will have zero scrap value at the end of the fourth year the level of working capital investment at the start of each year is expected to be 10 percent of the sales revenue in that year capital allowances would be available on the cost of the capital at 25 percent reducing balance basis and uh, pays tax on profits at an annual rate of 30 percent per year with tax being paid one year in area down company has a nominal cost of capital of 12 percent per year uh, so we have to calculate the the net present value using the nominal approach now 
when it says nominal approach uh, it actually means we should be inflating all the cash flows using the respective inflation rate or rates so we have to inflate the cash flows and when we inflate the cash flows those cash flows are called nominal cash flows and once we have inflated the cash flows we should always be using nominal cost of capital and i'll get back to this point uh, once we'll be using the cost of capital so zero one two three and four and because of the areas the tax be being paid in areas we should extend it to fifth year as well okay so sales since we we already have the figures of the sales in dollars so we do not ha don't have to multiply it with the price and the number of units so we'll just uh, directly pick the sales figure but since we know that these figures haven't been uh, uh, inflated so we have to inflate at a rate of 4.7 percent so 1 plus 4.7 percent and we should take a power to one So 1250 into 1 1.47, 1.047 raised to the power 1. So it will give us the inflated sales uh, revenue figure for year 1, 1309. And let me copy and paste it for the rest of the three years. And now we'll just need to make adjustment now. Which figure am I supposed to change? What do you people think? Which figure am I supposed to change? The only figure that I need to change is the sales figure. That's it. No need to change because the inflation rate is going to be the same since I have linked the power with the cell. So no need to change that as well. Just need to change the revenue figure and I have to use this second year revenue figure 2570. So it's going to be 2817. Similarly, I have to change this figure as well and I should make it 6890. And then it should be 4530. Nothing else needs to be changed. Now, this technique will help you out to save your time in your exams. I hope it's clear now. Now, now let's go to the variable cost. And if you just look at the question, uh, okay, they haven't told us that. It's a variable cost or what? Well, it's a cost, right? So it means it includes all the costs. And it's uh, 500 for the first year without inflation. And it should be infl inflated in the same way. 4.7% raised to the power 1. 524. And let us copy and paste these figures here. And just need to change the variable cost figure from 500 to 1000 for the second year then to 2500 for the third year and then 1750 for the fourth year okay now Remember when you are calculating NPV and you are preparing this NPV performer, make sure that uh, you subtract all the costs, all the costs that one has to, 
that one has to subtract before tax every tax allowable expenditure should be subtracted from the sales figure before tax is being calculated so this question is a bit simple in this regards as they have given us all the costs together so we don't have to worry about other costs so there are, there are no other costs so we can just simply okay let me uh let me net it off now and let's calculate the pre-tax cash flows and copy this and paste it so these are the pre-tax cash flows Um, Mavish, uh, on your screens in the chat box, uh, we have shared a code for joining the Google Classroom. So just go to Google Classroom and enter this code by joining the classroom. So you'll join my classroom, and in the classroom, you will have a better access to all the resources. In a very structured way okay now comes the text and uh, let us see uh, what was the text rate the text rate is 30 percent and since they have told us that the text will be paid in areas so we will start from year two and i'll just put the minus sign as tax will always be a cash outflow and it should be applied to the first year's pre-tax cash flow 785 into 30% so it will be 236 this is the tax related to year one and because of being paid in areas it should be shown in year two so all I have to do is to copy this cell and paste it so it will make the adjustments accordingly now is this the correct text figure or we need to make some adjustments to this to these figures do we have to do do we have to make some adjustments to these figures Yeah, we have to make adjustments to these figures. And in the last class, I explained the reason. So, uh, because tax authorities will allow us an additional expense to be claimed, named as capital allowance, or we call it tax depreciation as well. So, they'll be allowing us depreciation on the purchased asset at the rate of 25%. But since capital allowance figure is a non cash expense, therefore, we never subtract it from sales being being non-cash in nature but uh, if we do not subtract this amount from our sales figure our tax figure will be overstated and we have to adjust it accordingly by adding back tax benefit on capital allowance so what is the cost of the asset the cost of the asset is two million dollars so on this two on this figure a tax relief of 25 percent uh 25 percent of this will be allowed as expense for the first year and because of areas it will be shown in the second year so two million into 25 percent now this this is the capital allowance figure and we have to multiply it with the tax rate to get the tax benefit on this capital allowance figure for the first year is 150. so what i'm supposed to do in the second year what am i supposed to do in the second year
Well, there's a big difference, uh, Shadrach, between not showing the working, right? And not showing the working separately. I have shown all the working. Yes, I haven't shown, I haven't shown the working separately. I have shown within the cell. So if you show that working within the cell using the formula, it is equally acceptable. For the second year, for the second year, as I told you people in the previous session, we just have to take 75% of the previous year tax benefit. It is going to be 113. As the value of the asset will be depreciated each year by 25%, therefore the tax benefit will also be reduced by 25%. Similarly, for the next year, it should be multiplied with 75% and it is going to be 83.48 or we can just simply write 84. And in the last year, what are we supposed to be doing is we should pick up the cost of the asset 2 million into 75% raised to the power 3. So if we multiply it by 75% thrice, it will give us the tax WDV after the end of the third year and from this we have to subtract scrap value do we have any scrap value the investment project will have zero scrap value so there is no scrap value so i'll just write zero here so this is going to be the balancing allowance figure in the last year the tax authorities will allow us 844000 as our tax depreciation and we will be getting a relief of 30% on this amount. So tax benefit for the last year will be equal to 253,000. Okay. After the tax benefit, we should be picking up the working capital figure. Now, what is working capital? Working capital is a capital that you need for day-to-day -day activities of a business, right? So, according to this, according to this question, the working capital requirement for each year will be equal to 10% of the sales of that year. Like, for example, for the first year, to 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 run our day-to-day -day activities of the first year, we need working capital equal to 10 percent of the first year sales and it will be it will be 1309 into 10 percent so to run the day-to-day -day activities of the first year we need working capital of 131,000. now my question to all of you is at what point should this amount be injected should it be injected at the end of the first year or should be should it be injected at the start of the first year remember working capital of the first year will always be injected at the start of the first year as we will be needing this capital throughout the first year so we cannot afford to invest it at the end of the year whereas we will be needing it throughout the year so we have to inject it at the start of the year that means it should be shown in this column that the zero represents start of the first year so 131,000 should be invested at point zero so that we can run our day-to-day -day activities of year one right now remember working capital is a capital and the, the balance will be carried forward in the next year as well it's not expense it is the capital amount so we have injected one thirty one thousand dollars at point zero now what do we need for the second year so we have to calculate the total amount that we need for the second year for the second year we need 10 percent of the second year sales it is 282 now the total working capital required for activities of year two will be 282,000. Whereas we have already injected 131,000 
at the start of the first year. So since we have already injected 131,000 at the start of the first year, and that capital balance will be carried forward for the next year as well. But it won't be enough because in the second year, we need a total of 282,000. So how much additional working capital we will be injecting for year two? I need reply from everyone. We need a total of 282,000 of capital, whereas we have already injected 131,000. So the remaining amount needs to be injected. So from 282, we have to subtract 131 to see what's the additional amount that we have to inject. And it will it is going to be 151,000. So for the, at the end of the sec first year, which will be the start of the second year, we have to invest a further 151,000. Right, that's the figure which should be shown here. But in this case, how are we going to calculate it? Again, I'll show you a shortcut for this particular question. Since we know that working capital in this question is directly connected with the sales figure, and the reason why we need additional working capital is because of this, ad, ad, these, this additional sales figure. It is because of the additional sales that we need additional working capital. So what we need to do is we have to take the difference of the sales figure of the second year and the first year. And this difference will tell us what's our additional sales revenue figure. And for this additional sales figure, we need a working capital of 10%, a further 10%. So it is 151,000. So let me show it again. The working capital in this particular question is connected with the sales figure. And because we have a higher level of sales for the second year, that's why we need additional working capital. So if we can calculate the additional sales figure first and multiply it with the percentage of working capital required, we will get how much additional working capital do we need for the second year. And that has to be invested at the end of the first year so that we can run our activities for the second year. Similarly, what formula should I be applying in this cell? Who's going to tell me? What exact formula should I have in this cell? Yeah, very good. Excellent. Now, instead of putting the formula again, what about copying this formula and pasting it here? Same as that. Just copy this formula and paste it here. Rukaya, you have already answered, you have already asked the question. So you can use the same space for answering the question as well. So I'll continue with copying this formula and paste it here. And see, I've got a positive figure here. 
and what does this positive figure show it shows that we have to eject the working capital now why we will be needing to eject the working capital if you can just look at the year four sales figure it is less than the year three sales figure it's less than the year three sales figure so a, le a lesser amount of sales for year four would mean that we need a less amount of working capital since we have we have already injected a higher amount of working capital now we are supposed to eject our working capital and this will be shown as a positive figure because now we are withdrawing our working capital right so we don't have to do anything i just copied this formula pasted here and i've got that positive figure I need not to worry about it and now i'll copy it again and paste it here so i'll get another positive figure at the end of year four as well because at the end of year four the project will be completed and we will have to eject the remaining working capital that we have invested because there are no further years and we do not need the working capital that we have invested so we have to eject the remaining remaining amount as well now now just look at this how much we invested we invested 131 then we invested 151 then we invested 4509 so we invested a total of 791000 of working capital in the first 3 years but in the next year we withdraw with we withdrew 246000 out of 791000 so if we just reduce it by 246 the remaining working capital stuck up in the project will be 544 and this 544 will be withdrawn at the end of the fourth year So remember one thing irrespective of how much working capital we invest we have to eject it at the end of the project i hope that's clear Okay, so we're done with the working capital. Now it's time to adjust initial investment, which is $2 million. And we don't have any scrap value. So let us write zero instead. And uh, we, don't know, we do not have any other cash flows left. So we just net off all the cash flows. So these are our net cash flows. And since we have inflated all the cash flows, all these cash flows are nominal cash flows. So we have to use nominal cost of capital for discount factors. And uh, coincidentally, they have given us nominal cost of capital of 12 percent so we don't have to do anything just calculate all the discount factors using this rate one plus 12 percent raised to the power minus zero and so now we have got discount factors for all five years and let us now calculate present values 
by multiplying cash flow with the discount factor. Here we go. We are done with all the present values. And let us calculate now NPV by summing up all these. So it's three, nine, four, five, and we know that these figures were reduced by thousands. So that's the net present value. And if we, if we have to comment, the comment will be accept the project as it has positive net present value. Working capital is a capital figure. It's not an expense. It's a capital that we have investing. Is it clear? Okay, from one to 10, quick. Okay, now I'm giving you people 10 minutes to solve the same question using the real approach. Now, in the real approach, all you have to do is ignore inflation, right? Just ignore inflation and calculate the net present value by ignoring the inflation. And uh, once you people have calculated the net cash flows, and before applying the discount factor, let me know. Because once you have calculated the net cash flow figures, then I'll be showing the uh, discussing. I'll I'll discuss the concept of the real cost of capital. So you have ten minutes from now. Calculate net present do not calculate net present value just calculate net cash flows using the real approach
So I hope you people have done it. So I'm just picking. Copying it, pasting it here. And uh, firstly, I have to remove the inflation factor. From all the cells. Now these cash flows are called real cash flows. When we do not inflate our cash flows and we show them as it is, these are called real cash flows. Okay, tell me, do I have to make some adjustments? Um, uh, do I have to adjust the text figure or is it, it should be the same as shown? Yeah, we should keep it as same because we do not have to do anything as the rate was applied to this figure which is which is already adjusted so we don't have to do anything what about the tax benefits should i keep them as it is or will there be any change to these figures as well Yeah, they should remain the same as well. So inflation does not affect tax benefits. Okay, what about the working capital? Yeah, no need to no need to change the working capital as well. Initial investment will remain the same, the no scrap value. Okay, all the cash flows will now be the same. So only the cost of capital needs to be changed now. So what we have to do is we have to convert this nominal cost of capital into the real cost of capital. And the formula is, it is called Fisher formula, one plus nominal rate is equal to one plus the real rate into one plus inflation rate and inflation rate in this formula should always be the general inflation rate remember which should always be the general inflation rate so we have to use this formula to convert the nominal rate into the real rate right so if we re rearrange this formula what we have to do is we have to have one plus nominal rate divided by one plus inflation rate then we have to subtract this one and that that's how we will get the real rate so we need to have one plus nominal rate that is one plus 12 percent divided by one plus the inflation rate because it is multiplied here and should be divided to the other side okay uh one plus inflation rate which is 4.7 percent and once we get this answer we have to subtract this one minus one and let us convert it into percentage format so it is going to be 6.97 percent that's the real rate so once you have used real cash flows you should never use the nominal cost of capital we should be using the real cost of capital which is 6.97 percent and uh, since we have excel we don't need to round it off to seven percent we can simply use the same rate for calculating discount factors by just referring to the cell. So how, how we do that is equal to one plus refer to the cell 
and since we will be copying and pasting this formula to the next cell and we don't want excel to change the reference otherwise it is going to change the reference it's 0 280 at the moment if i copy this formula from this cell and i just paste it here it will change the reference of the cell by default which i don't want it to change i want the cell reference to be the same as i want the same rate to be applied to all these cells now how can i keep this reference fixed so for that i have to place dollar sign before the column number the column alphabet that is zero so i have to place dollar sign before zero i'm telling excel that it should not be changing the cell reference if i copy and paste this formula in any other cell that's how we tell excel do not change the reference so since i don't want it to change the column from o to p therefore i have just placed the dollar sign before the column label that is zero and if i don't want it to change the raw i have to place i have to place the dollar sign before the raw number as well but i don't need to do it at, at the moment raised to the power minus zero and i've got the discount factor for year zero let me paste it here and now it's 0 0.935 and you just look at it it's still 0 280 and it hasn't changed this reference look at it it's 0 280 and it is the same in the next cell as well but if you just look at here it's 0 265 and since i haven't put any dollar sign so when i paste this formula to the next cell it will change it from 0 to so from o to p here we go it's p now since i haven't put any dollar sign so let me copy it to the next cell and i'm getting all the discount factors and now i've got present values as well by simply multiplying these figures and now let us calculate npv three nine eight one so i hope it's clear now okay now we have got few questions here so can we have can we deflate the pretext of nominal approach with general inflation and solve why do we do why do we need to do that we'll simply remove the text rates especially when we have well that's 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 a different way uh, and you must have seen that the, uh, in that question, both nominal and real approaches uh, resulted in the same NPV. Wasn't that, Fatima? 
Yeah, the slight difference might might have been because of uh, uh, rounding off, I think. But here we don't need to because we inflated it and we just removed the inflation. Yeah, but yeah, but the, there there is a reason why this difference is there. There's a reason why this difference is here. Uh, the, the reason is uh, we have used the same tax benefit figures even when we were using the real approach. But here the tax figures were the same, whereas the tax rate, the, the, the discount factor was different. And with the same cash, with the same cash flow figures, here we have used a different cost of capital. Obviously, that will result in a different NPV then. Okay, now uh, uh, there's another question. Uh, Anika, uh, there is no WhatsApp group, so you can just join my Google Classroom using the code given here BFAQG5X. Just use this code, go to the Google Classroom, search for the Google Classroom, click on join the classroom, and use this code to join my classroom. So we are done with all the CRQs of investment appraisal so far and let us now go to the MCQs part and let's now discuss MCQs. Should we start now? Are you people ready for the MCQs? So here we go. Uh, we have a question. Uh, AB company is to receive an annuity of $450, which commences in 10 years' time and will last into perpetuity at a cost of at a cost of capital of 15%. What is the net present value of the annuity? Okay. Um, when 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 we have perpetuity. Let me quickly explain the concept of perpetuity first, right? Um, a perpetuity is basically a, a, a constant amount that you are going to receive for indefinite period of time, right? Like, like forever. So how do we calculate present value of perpetuity? Now, in my last session, I told you the concept of present value. Present value of any cash inflow is basically the maximum that we should be investing for that cash flow if we need a particular return like for example let me give you an example let's say somebody told us that they will be paying us five thousand dollars forever five thousand dollars forever and the first five thousand dollars will be received in one year's time right five thousand dollars and they will start giving us five thousand dollars every year forever okay now, obviously, they won't give, it, give us this for free. We have to invest an amount. Since they will be giving us this forever, the investment has to be there forever as well. So we'll be investing an amount forever, and against that investment, we'll be getting $5,000 every year forever. Now, tell me how much we should be investing, or what maximum amount should we be investing for these cash flows if we need a return of 10% if i need annual return of 10% every year how much maximum should i be investing for this cash inflow that i'm going to receive forever i need a return of 
50,000, obviously, because if I take 10% of 50,000, I get 5,000. So if I invest 50,000 here, for this, and I need 10% of return, so 10% of my investment, that is 50,000, will be equal to $5,000. So the maximum I should be investing should be 50,000. So how do we calculate that? We'll just simply take this amount and divide it by our required rate of return. It may be cost of capital or it may be anything else. So let's divide it. Divide the enmity figure by the cost of capital figure. We'll get the same answer, 50,000. And the same answer will be called present value. And the same answer will be called present value. We, we, we call it present value of perpetuity. That is the maximum we should be investing if we are looking for a return of 10%. Right? So the formula, in short, for calculating the present value of perpetuity will be present value of perpetuity will be NVT, that is the amount that we are going to receive every year, divided by the rate of return or the cost of capital. But the condition is that the first payment is going to be received in one year's time because we will be needing 10% return right from the very first year. So the condition is that we should be receiving $5,000 in one year's time. Now, what if there is a delay in receiving the first payment? So if we are, we are, if we are going to receive, or if we are going to uh, receive the first $5,000 in two years time or three years time or four years time, that means there is a delay in that case, how do we calculate present value of perpetuity? Present value of perpe delayed perpetuity will be calculated by dividing the NVT by R and then multiplying it by the discount factor. The discount factor here should be for the number of years delayed beyond year one. What does that mean? We have to pick up discount factor, but which year's discount factor should be used? It will be decided by how much delay is there in receiving the first payment. Usually we are supposed to receive after the end of the first year. But if we we are being told that the first payment will be received in three years time. That means there is a delay of two years because it was supposed to be received in one year's time. And instead of getting it after one year, we are getting it after three years, which means there is a delay of two years. So we will pick two years discount factor and multiply it with this formula. And in that case, we will get the present value of delayed perpetuity. Now let's look at this question. The annuity is 450, but it's it, it is saying that it, it is going to start in 10 years time. So which discount factor should we be using? Tell me the discount factor that we should be using. It should be the year nine discount factor as it is going to be starting from year 10, right? So it should be the year nine. Okay. So the formula will be 450 divided by the cost of capital, which is 15%. This will be the answer in case it starts from year one. Since it's starting from year 10, there's a nine years delay. So I'll multiply it with 0 0.284. The nine years discount factor and the NPV of the NVT to the nearest $10. It says $10. So nearest ten dollar is eight fifty. So that's the answer. Is that clear? Okay, read this question on your screens and tell me what's the answer.
and I think you should have the answer to this question. Okay, tell me one thing. Is it possible to have no IRR for a project? Is it possible for a project to have no IRR at all? Okay, what is IRR? Tell me first. What is IRR? Yeah, the discount rate at which the net present value will be zero. So, is it necessary? Is it necessary that you will always have a discount rate for for every project at which the NPV of that project will be zero? Okay, remember, remember one thing that it is always possible to have a zero IRR. That is, that is, we may come across a project whose NPV may not get zero at any rate. What if a project already has a negative NPV? at zero percent what if the project cash outflows are more than its cash inflows even if we don't discount you know that by increasing the rate it will further reduce the npv so if it's already negative and the more you increase the discount rate the higher negative npv it will be it will be giving so there will be no point where you'll be getting a zero NPV again. So there is always possibility that you may not have any rate at which your NPV will be zero. So zero NPV, zero IRR is always the case. It, it will always be possible to have no IRR whatsoever. Now remember this. Now, the problem is, should it be zero or two? Tell me, zero is always possible, right? So what does this option tell us? This is telling us that the, that, that the project will never have one IRR. So that cannot be a true answer as it may have one IRR as well. So it may have zero and one. So this answer can't be the true one. If you just look at this, it does not have zero. And it's saying there will be only two IRRs. No, that can't be an option. This may be an option. A is the option. A normal project, which we call conventional cash flow project. Conventional cash flow project is one which may have negative NPVs at the start of the project. Ne sorry, negative cash flows at the start of the project. But once we start getting positive net cash flows, we will never get negative net cash flow again. That is called a conventional cash flow project. For example, 
in the first year we had net cash negative net cash flow of four thousand dollars in the next year maybe we again get a negative net cash flow of two thousand dollars but once we start getting the positive cash flows we will always get positive net cash flows thereafter it will never become negative again if this is the case or this is the pattern of the cash flows it is called conventional cash flow conventional cash flows right so not necessarily we will have negative cash flow in the second uh, in the second year as well maybe we start getting positive cash flow right from the uh, second year but once we start getting the positive cash flows we will never get back a negative net cash flow that's called conventional cash flows but non conventional cash flow project non conventional cash flows are ones in which the pattern of the cash flows will be such that even after getting positive cash flows we may get negative cash flow again like negative negative positive positive and we may get a negative cash flow again and we can simply say that positive cash flows are sandwiched between two negative cash flows such type of cash flow pattern is called non conventional cash flow project so any project having these non conventional cash flow cash flows will have the possibility of getting more than one irr in a conventional cash flow project remember one thing in a conventional cash flow project you will have zero irrs or you you will have one irr in a non conventional cash flow project you may have zero irrs you may have one irr or you may have two irrs so always remember this i hope it's clear now Now this is a question of uh, sensitivity analysis. That's a question for sensitivity analysis. Look at the requirement. By what percentage can variable cost increase before the project becomes not worthwhile? That is the maximum increase in percentage terms we can afford in variable costs. In other words, it's asking for the project's sensitivity towards variable cost. Now, we have to do some calculations. So, in order to calculate uh, the sensitivity of a project towards a project variable, what you need to do is you have to calculate NPV and you have to have present value of that project variable. In this case, it's variable cost. So, cash inflows are 15,500 in the first year, 15,500 in the second year, right? So, we have 15,500. We can say it's sales figure. Let us assume that it's a sales figure. And it's 15,500 for two years. So, if it's for two years, we can simply use annuity factor of two years to calculate present value. So one plus one plus, okay. They've already given us discount factors, so we don't need to recalculate it. So discount factors are 0 0.870 plus, since we need annuity factors, so we have to add the discount factors, 756. That's the annuity factor and let us calculate the present value. 
then from this we have to subtract variable costs outflows 5000 per year again the same annuity factor now we have got the present present value of cash inflows or we can say the maximum we should be investing for this project is 17073 whereas the required investment is is $15,000 so the net present value of this project which is which will be positive 207 now at the moment with present situation we are going to accept this project so if everything remains the same we sh we, we are willing to invest as the npv is positive but since this npv sub condition uh, is is dependent on our sales revenue and our cost of uh, our, our variable costs so if either of these two either of these two changes the npv will change so how much change we can afford in one of these two variables in this case they are asking for the change in the variable cost so we'll just focus on the variable cost so the formula for calculating sensitivity is npv whatever npv you calculate divided by present value of project variable so npv in this case is 2073 divided by the project variable in this case is variable cost as they are asking how much change we can afford in the variable cost so the project variable here is, is the variable cost and the present value of the variable cost is 8130 8130 so we have to divide npv by the present value of the project variable and it's it should be converted into percentage so it's 25.5 percent and as per their requirement we should report it in second single decimal place so 25.5 percent what does that mean it means that if our variable cost which is 5000 per year at the moment if this increases by 25 percent our net present value will be equal to zero let us test it and see if uh, this holds true so let me copy this and paste it here and let me change the variable cost figure and increase it by 25.5 percent so i'll just click on it and i'll multiply it by one plus this 25.5 percent and let me see let me see if i increase this figure by 25.5 percent whether the net present value will be zero or not it's going to be zero so if there's increase of 25.5 percent in your net present value sorry in your variable cost your net present value will be equal to zero so that's the correct figure 25.5 percent so we cannot afford any increase above this 25.5 percent otherwise the net present value will be negative okay can you people just calculate can you just calculate the sensitivity of the project towards the cash inflows that is the sales figure how much fall how much decrease in percentage percentage terms we can afford in sales figure
Okay, we'll apply the same formula with different figures. NPV should be the same, but we should be dividing it by the present value of sales figure and uh, convert it into percentage. So it's uh, 8.23 percent. So let me uh, test it. Let's get it back to 5,000 and let us reduce this figure. Reduce this figure by 8.23 percent. Oh, zero. So if our sales revenue falls by 8.23 percent, or selling price falls by 8.23 percent, our net present value will be zero. Now I'll I, I I will let you people solve these questions yourselves. You have access to this whole workbook. I'll just try to solve those questions which I feel should be solved so that you can revise and uh, Clear your concepts. Like, let's go to this one. It asks for profitability index. Calculate the profitability index for this project. Now, what is profitability index? Uh, let us first do some calculations, and and I, and I will explain profitability index to you. Uh, Present value of future cash flows is twelve hundred thousand, and uh, the capital outlay at time zero is two fifty thousand. Okay, what do you people think will be the net present value? What will be the net present value? So in order to calculate net present value, since we already have present value of cash inflows, the only problem is that we don't have the present value of cash outflow of this figure. So we have to calculate the present value of cash outlay or outflow of 200,000 into 1.1 raised to the power minus one it's one eight
1818 that's the present value of these this cash flow and then present value of other cash flow total present value of outflows will be this plus 250000 so this is it now there are two ways of calculating profitability index just look at it one way of calculating is simply take the present value of cash inflows which is 1200000 and divide it by the present value of cash outflows and it is going to be 2.78 times or whatever you call it 2.78 what does this tell us this tells us that if we invest one dollar today if we invest one dollar today we will be getting 2.78 dollars of cash inflow today if if we go for this project that is our cash inflows. The present value of our cash inflows will be 2.78 times of whatever we are investing today. Another, the other way of calculating is to find out the NPV first. 1200,000 minus this one. That's the NPV. Now, another way of calculating the profitability index is to divide NPV by the initial investment that is the present value of cash outflows it will be 1.78 times now, the difference between these two figures is actually here we have just picked up the net present value that is the surplus amount and divided and we have divided it by the investment whereas in this case we haven't just picked the surplus amount we have picked up the total present value of cash inflows so that's why it is 2.78 times and it is 1.78 times this shows the surplus that is the npv and this tells us the total present value of cash inflows that's the difference between the two so both ways in both ways we can calculate the profitability index so if i just cut it short profitability index will either be npv divided by initial investment or present value of cash outflows or profitability index will be calculated as present value of cash inflows that is without subtracting the cash outflow divided by present value of cash outflows that is investment So in this 1.78 case, we have used the NPV figure. This NPV figure. Whereas for this 2.78, we have used the total present value of cash inflows. That's the only difference between the two. So both of the two formulas are acceptable. Again, solve this one. Now this is a question of capital rationing. It's a it's the question, it's a question of capital rationing. Capital rationing is where you don't have enough capital available to invest in all the pro pro possible projects like in this case the company has a total of 280000 capital whereas it has three profitable projects all of these three projects have positive npvs all three have positive npvs so obviously company would like to invest in all these three projects but if we add the investment the required investment it's 470000 dollars 120 plus 150 270 plus 200 470000 whereas the total capital available is 280000 so the company does not have sufficient capital available and such a situation is called capital rationing now 
with this available capital how can we earn maximum npv that's what we are we are we have to calculate calculate the maximum npv assuming all three projects are indivisible now indivisible what is meant by indivisible indivisible means we cannot have any of these projects proportionately for example if we do not have one twenty thousand dollars even if we have 20 30 40 50 thousand dollars we cannot invest in this project we will either invest the whole amount of 120 thousand dollars or we have to leave this project we cannot invest partially such type of a project is called indivisible project non-divisible project but if we have the option of investing either one twenty thousand dollars or we may invest any part like if we don't have one twenty thousand dollars but we still have the option of investing just twenty thousand dollars obviously in that case we won't be getting the total mpv we'll just be getting the proportionate share but since we will have the option of investing partially such type of project is called a divisible project so we have two eighty thousand dollars and we can't have partial investment in either of these three projects so what options do we have now can can we have the first project can we invest in the first project yes or no can we just invest in the first project yes yes we can yeah can we also invest in second project at the same time like undertaking both the projects at the time yes if we invest in both the projects the total required investment will be 270000 whereas we have 280000 dollars so we can have this combination so in case of non divisible projects we prepare we we first develop combinations the possible combinations now we can have aa and we can have bb and if we do it we will have to invest a total of 120,000 plus 150,000, which is well within our range, 270,000. In that case, the total net present value that we will be earning will be 130,000 plus 150,000. So that's the pos total possible NPV that we will be earning. Now, can we have the first project and the third project together? Can we have the first and the third project project together? No, we can't have. We have a total capital available of 280,000, whereas we need 120,000 and 200, 320,000 dollars for these two projects. We don't have, so we can't have these two projects together. So what option do we have? What another option we have? Can we have these two together? BB and CC? Again, no. We will be needing three fifty thousand. We don't have. So, can we have CC alone? Can we have CC alone? Yeah. We we need two hundred thousand, and we have two eighty thousand. So we can have CC alone, and in that case, we'll be earning a total NPV of two hundred ten thousand. So this is this is these are the two options that we have. Option one, option two, and we don't have any option three. So what do you think? Which option is better? Obviously, option one. And the maximum NPV will be 280,000, and that's gonna be the answer. So let us take a break of 10 minutes and when we will be back from the break we will go through mtqs multiple tasking questions of investment appraisal and then we will solve mcqs of cost of capital and business valuation today 
and tomorrow we will be solving a couple of mtqs related to the cost of capital and business valuation and a couple of crqs so let us take a 10 minutes break uh, we will be back after 10 minutes and uh, before we go for a break if i can have if i can have a quick feedback of the session so far Okay, probably the rest of the people they are sleeping, I guess. So let us take a break of 10 minutes and we'll be back after 10 minutes.
Okay, welcome back. And let's start discussing the multiple choice question section. That's the first scenario where we have to calculate sensitivity and the sensitivity with regards to change in sales volume. Okay, uh, so we have to basically calculate the percentage of change in the sales volume before the NPV gets negative. So it will be done in the same way, uh, like we just did it a while ago. So sales each year will be 10,300. Then we have variable costs, 3,200. And uh, the cost of capital is 9%, so we need annuity factor. 1 plus 9% raised to the power minus 2. And uh, then whole divided by 9%. And the same would be used for variable cost as well. Let us multiply these two figures with the, with the annuity factors to get the present values. We have present values and then that's the contribution. We don't have any fixed cost, I guess. We don't have any fixed cost. Right. They have already given us the NPV as well, but I'm going through all the process in case uh, the question hasn't given us any NPV. So I'm also calculating the NPV. So since we don't have any fixed cost, so now we have to subtract initial investment. And that is 11,000. And uh, we subtract 11,000. It's 1489 exactly what they have told us the NPV to be 149, so that's NPV. Now, we have to find out the percentage change in the sales volume that will reduce the NPV to zero. So whenever you have to calculate the sensitivity of the project towards the sales volume, remember we should be picking up NPV and dividing it by the present value of the contribution. Because if the sales volume go down, it will not only affect the revenue figure, it will also reduce the variable cost figure as well. Therefore, we should always pick the net of these two, which is the contribution figure. So the present value of contribution should be used while calculating the percentage of sensitivity with regards to sales volume. Here we go. Uh, it's going to be 11.9% option C. That is if the sales volume falls by 11.9%, that this net present value will be zero. So C is the option. Then we are required to calculate the discounted payback period of the project. Discounted payback period of the project. Discounted payback period of the project. So, initial investment. is $11,000 at 
at point zero, then at point one, we have cash net cash inflow. of the difference between cash inflows and cash outflows that is 10,300 minus minus 3200 7,100 then for second year the cash inflow will remain the same 10,300 minus 3200 then we have to apply discount factors one for year zero and one point is one point zero nine raised to the power minus one for the first year then one point zero nine raised to the power minus two for the second year and then we have to calculate present values then for payback period, we always calculate commutative cash flow. Commutative cash flow. At year zero, we have invested 11,000, right? But after one year of the $11,000 that we have invested, we have recovered 7513.76. So we are still to recover. 4486 after the first end of the first year because this is what we have recovered so this is the remaining amount of investment that we have to recover and then we have recovered 5975.93 and now we have a surplus which means that this project took one complete year and some part of the second year in order to recover the investment so what that part is that's what you need to find out at the end of the first year, what we were supposed to recover was 4486. This is what we were supposed to recover. That's what we were supposed to recover. Whereas in the whole year, that is the second year, we have recovered 597.53. So if this part is representing the complete year, and we were interested in just this part of recovery. This was the remaining investment left. So what is this amount as a fraction of this total amount? That's what we need to find out. So we'll divide with, with whatever we were supposed to recover by what we have recovered throughout the year. This will tell us part of the second year in which we have recovered this so in the complete second year we recovered 5.93 dollars whereas in 0.75 of this year in 0.75 of this year that is 75 percent of the year we have recovered this amount so it took us one complete year and 0.75 of the second year to recover our investment so one plus part of the second year that is 1.75 years so we can simply say that it took 1.75 years for us to recover our investment that's called discounted payback period d is the answer 1.75 years one complete year and 0.75 of the second year clear Okay, then we have to calculate IRR and they have given us a hint that um, we have to use 15% and 18, 20%, right? So we have to calculate IRR, but first we have to 
use 15% as a discount rate to find out the NPV and then we have to use 20% as a discount rate to find the NPV. So let us go back to this part and see uh, Let us change the discount rate to 15% and see what's the NPV. So we just we'll just write it at 15%. We have an NPV of 8.3.8.2.3.8. And let us change it again to 20%. I did a mistake earlier as well. We also have to change this one as well. 20% it's negative 153. And at 15% we have to calculate again. So now using the IRR formula, we have to find out IRR. So the IRR formula is the lower rate, that is 15%, plus the positive NPV, which is 543, divided by the positive minus the negative which will eventually be added because this is already minus and then multiplied by the difference of the two rates that is 20 percent minus 15 percent that's the formula for IRR no you don't have IRR function there that's IRR 18 point nine percent eighteen point nine percent is the answer A option now let me let me also tell you a shortcut which may, may not work in every case but may work in some cases just look at this shortcut right I'm just telling you a shortcut but that may not work in every case right but in in case we have MCQs or MTQs with four options available it may work you know that IRR is the rate at which NPV will be zero right now let's take the midpoint of these two figures can you just tell me the midpoint of these two figures 20 percent and 15 percent the two rates what will be the midpoint of these two rates if 15 percent is here 20 percent is here what will be the midpoint of these two figures 17.5% yeah just simply add these two and divide it by 2 it's 17.5% yeah that's my own shortcut so don't tell anyone else Okay, 15% and 17.5%, right? And 10, 20%. Okay. And the NPV here is 543. 
and the NPV here is minus 153. Okay, which NPV is closer to zero? 543 or minus 153? Which of the two NPVs is closer to zero? minus 153 yeah that's more closer to zero so your irr will fall between these two ranges that is 17.5 percent to 20 percent and if you have any option that falls within this range that's the irr look at this of the four options which option falls within this range Seven more than 17.5 and less than 20 percent. Which of the four options? A. That's the IRA 18.9 percent. So you don't have to go through that formula. You can just use this shortcut, and it it may work in some circumstances where you have options available. There's more probability. There's high probability that this trick will work. Okay, we have another question. Trecor company can claim tax allowable depression on 25% reducing balance basis. It pays tax at an annual rate of 30% one year in area. What amount of tax relief would be received by Trecor in time four of an NPV calculation? So you have to calculate the tax relief, the tax saving in the fourth year. Let's go back to the question and see what's the data. There you go. You have a machine costing $250,000, which will last for four years and then will be sold for $5,000. And uh, that means in the fifth, in the fourth year, it will be sold for $5,000. And if the tax depreciation is 25% reducing balance basis and the tax rate is 30% and it will be claimed in areas what amount of tax relief would be received by truck trekor in time four of an NPV calculation? Okay, I'll go through all the years just for your revision. I'll go for all the years. First of all, let's calculate it for year one. The cost of the asset is 250,000. And uh, we should take 25% of this figure to find out the capital loss for the first year. And we should be taking 30%, right? To calculate the tax benefit. That's for year one, but will be paid in area that is, it will be received in year two. So it is related to year one, but since the tax is paid in area, so the benefit is going to be received in year two. Then comes year two, which will be 25% less than this amount. And this is something that we will be receiving in year three. Then we have year three, which will be 25% less than the previous amount. And this is something that will be received in year four. And that's what they were asking. This is the answer. This is the answer. This is what they were looking for. What benefit we will be receiving in year four? 10547. Then comes the year four. Now this will be calculated in this way. 25,000, 250,000 into 
75 percent raised to the power three minus the scrap value which is five thousand and uh, that will be the balancing allowance figure and after the balancing allowance figure we have to multiply it by the 30 percent tax rate and that's something related to year four but will be received in year five so let let us go through the question again and see what they have asked us to calculate they've asked us to calculate what amount of tax relief would be received by trecor in time four of an npv calculation that's it this is the year four payment. that's the answer so the mistake that most of the students made make in the exam pressure may be that they pick up this value this is related to year four but won't be received in year four this is this is going to be received in year five right so one of the tricks is what has been used in this question another thing could have been they may have asked you to calculate the present value of this tax benefit rather than asking for the tax benefit they may have asked you to calculate the present value of this tax benefit so the next step would have been to multiply this figure with the fourth year's discount factor to find out the present value is that clear now since you people have access to this file you can just simply go through the rest of the questions uh, as they would be very simple ones uh, i have left it for you uh, I've tried my level best to pick up the most important areas so that you can have a quick revision of those areas. So uh, that's it for investment appraisal. But my support, as I as been as I have been telling you people, will be there till your exams. Don't worry. You can always ask me uh, through that uh, Google Classroom. If there is any question related to investment appraisal that is putting you people in trouble in one way or the other, you can just drop that um, drop message on Google Classroom with the screenshot or with the question uh, on, on that Google Classroom, and I, I, I will try my level best to respond uh, promptly. Now let us start practicing mcqs for cost of capital first and then we will move towards business valuation the first question is the estimated cost of the company's equity using the dividend growth model and market price is okay so we have to calculate the cost of equity using the dividend growth model so i hope that you people remember the formula you know the formula of um, cost of equity using the dividend growth model so Yes, I'm trying to display the screen. I don't know what has happened. I'm trying to fix this issue.
just give me a minute i'm just fixing the issue
Can you people see the screen now? Okay. Okay, now let's calculate uh, the cost of equity using the dividend growth model. So let me write the formula of how we calculate cost of equity using the dividend growth model. K is equal to current dividend 1 plus G, that's the growth rate, divided by the market price per share plus the growth. That's the formula. So for that we need current dividend. D naught is the current dividend, the recent dividend paid. So what's the current dividend? Can you just tell me what's the current dividend? It's 31st December 2001. Thirty-five cents, right? Yep. It's thirty-five cents. Okay. What's the growth rate? Ten percent per annum. One plus ten percent. And it should be no uh, in dividends and earnings. Okay, then it should be divided by market price, current market price. What's the current market price? 250 cents. And then we have to add the growth again. Twenty five point four percent is the cost of equity. The next one four years ago, a company paid a dividend of six hundred and ten thousand on a share capital of four million ordinary shares. Of 50 cents each it has just paid a dividend of 960,000 on the same capital and the current market price is well, my price of the share is 300 cents what is the estimated cost of equity so first of all we have to calculate the growth rate so uh, it's advisable to calculate growth rate using per share dividend rather than the total dividend because sometimes the total dividend figure may increase because of increased number of shares and if the total dividend has increased because of the total number of shares has increased that's not considered to be a growth it's not a growth so growth is advisable to be calculated based on the per share dividend now in this case the dividend that was paid a year ago or four years ago sorry was six hundred ten thousand dollars with four million shares okay so let us divide it by four million shares so it's fifteen point one five two five and uh, better to convert it into cents so let's put two more zeros so that we can have this dividend in cents that's this dividend per share four years ago dividend per share current dividend per share will be nine sixty thousand dollars and let us put two more zeros to convert it into cents and it says that the share capital was the same as before so four million so it's 24 cents so in four years time your dividend has increased from 20 from 15.25 cents to 24 cents now how can we calculate growth rate 
So one of the ways through which we calculate growth rate is the compound interest formula. As you all know, the compound interest formula is S is equal to P into 1 plus R. And instead of R, we should write G raised to the power N. So S in this case is the latest dividend. It should be the latest dividend. And P should be the earliest dividend paid. And basically what we are doing is we're just trying to find out that at what rate this dividend has grown into this dividend in these many years. That's what we basically want to find out. Now, if we rearrange this formula for growth, this formula will be the P will be divided here. So it will be S divided by P. And on the other hand, we will be one having one plus G raised to the power N. So to, in order to cancel this N, we have to take power as one upon N. Then this power will be canceled and we'll be left with one plus G and this one will be subtracted on this side. And in this way, we can calculate compound growth rate. That's how we calculate compound growth rate. So S, what do you think will be S? Which dividend should be considered as S out of these two? Michael, I have just divided the latest dividend with the total number of shares. So which should be considered as S? S is the latest dividend. That is the current dividend. It should be considered as S. And the earliest dividend in the data will be considered as P. So what we are finding out is that from this to this, what was the rate of growth? So let us put the values S 24 cents divided by P raised to the power one upon four as the number of years between these two dividends is four minus one. And let us convert it into a percentage figure. It's 12 percent. So the growth rate is 12 percent. Now we have to find out KE using the dividend growth model formula. For that we need current dividend which is 24 cents. We have to multiply it with 1 plus G the growth rate. And then it should be the whole divided by the market price. The market price is 300 cents. So should be divided by 300 and then we should add the growth again which is 12 percent so it's 20.96 the cost of equity is 20.96. Do we have any option? Yes, if we round it off to single decimal place, it's 21%. So the first option. Cost of equity is 21%. Okay. Now, cost of debt. We have to calculate the cost of debt. Grab company has, okay, before I calculate cost of debt, let me tell you a few terms and the difference between these terms so that you always know the difference between different terms used, um, especially in the cost of capital and business valuation topics. Uh, coupon rate. Coupon rate. Coupon rate or we call the interest rate. These are two same things. So don't get confused between these two terms. Coupon rate is the same rate as interest rate. Whereas cost of debt. 
IRR or interest yield, these are the terms uh, used interchangeably. And they are different from, from coupon rate or interest rate. There's a difference between these two. Interest rate or coupon rate is simply the amount, the percentage of interest that you're getting every year. But when we are talking about cost of debt or IRR, it's the overall return, annual return, the overall annualized return that we get from, from, uh, from an investment in the form of debt. Uh, let me give you an example. Let's say we have a debenture and the value of the debenture is let's say $100. And if we invest in this debenture, we will be investing $100 today. Against this, we, have, we are being told that we will be getting 7% interest every year. So that's one part of our return. And we are being told that after four years, instead of getting $100, we'll be getting $105 upon redemption. So the company is asking for $100 today, will be giving us 7% return and really that's one part of our return. And then they'll be returning $105 after four years. So the total return that we are getting is in the form of, we are getting it in two forms. One is the annual interest and the other is when, we, when, the, when the loan will be redeemed at a higher value than it is issued. So the additional $5 that we are going to receive in four years time is also part of a return. And when we convert it into annual terms, our total return will be higher than 7%. And that particular return will be called your cost of debt or IRR. So interest rate is just one single part of the overall return. That's the difference between coupon rate and cost of debt or IRR. So let's just look at this question. The coupon rate in this case is 8%, 8% eight bond, eight bond. That's the coupon rate, the interest rate that we are going to get every year or we are going to pay to our investors every year. That are redeemable at par in four years time. So the bond will be redeemed at par, that is $100. Interest is paid annually and an interest payment has just been made. The current market price of the bond is $108. That is X interest price because when you pay interest, the current market of price of the bond will always be X interest. That is after subtracting the interest. So this is X interest price. Tax is 25% and tax is payable in the same year as the profits to which the tax relates. So what are we supposed to calculate? We are supposed to calculate the cost of debt. Now, how do we do that? The current market value of this bond is $108, whereas after four years, we will be redeeming $100. Now, let's just treat this as an investment for the time being. Just think from an investor's point of view. From an investor's point of view, From an investor's point of view, from an investor point of view, at point zero, you are supposed to invest one zero eight dollars. That is the current value of this bond. You have to subscribe it for one zero eight, right? Minus one zero eight, and that's market value of the bond. Cash flow. Against this investment, you will receive interest for four years, and that interest is 8%. This is the annuity that we are going to receive 8%. 8% of the par value. Remember, interest rate is always applied to the par value. The par value is 100, and it should be multiplied with 8% to get the interest figure annually that we are going to receive if we are the investors. Eight dollar, but that should be taken as after tax, and the tax rate was twenty five percent, so it should be seventy five percent. So we have to subtract tax from this, 
as interest is always tax allowable expenditure so net of tax this is what we are going to receive every year this is what we are going to invest today so that we can receive this six dollar for four years and after four years we will get our value back that's called redemption value and in our case it's just hundred dollars so we'll be getting hundred dollars back that's cash inflow for investor so from investors perspective that's the investment that's why we have written it as a minus figure but from a company's perspective that will be an inflow because company will be getting this cash flow once it will be issuing this debt so for the time being we are looking at from a from an investor's perspective so this is what the investor is going to invest and this is what the investor is going to get for four years and after four years the investor will also get this this hundred dollar amount now we have to find out how much the investor is earning as a percentage the annual percentage of return and that's irr so just treat it as as an investment we have to find out irr of this investment and we'll go through the same process as the irr process where we have to discount these cash flows at two rates ensuring that at one rate we get positive npv and at the other rate we get a negative npv so let me assume a discount let me assume a discount rate of say five percent let's take five percent as our first discount rate so in year one it should be one for year zero it should be one and since this is an annuity of four years we have to calculate annuity factor one minus one plus five percent raised to the power minus four divided by five percent that's the annuity factor and then this is the single amount that we are going to receive after four years so we don't need to use annuity factor in this case as it's a singular amount so we have to calculate the discount factor one plus five percent raised to the power minus four that's the discount factor and using these discount factor let us calculate present values of these cash flows these are present values at five percent and that's my net present value that's net present value so the net present value is already negative at five percent so what do you people think what should the next rate be should it be higher than five percent or lower than five percent it should be lower than five percent as is we have already got a negative npv at five percent so if i increase this rate the npv will be further negative so i don't I, I won't be decreasing it i won't be increasing this rate i will be having i'll be getting a lower rate to find out the next net present value so let us take two percent let's say let us calculate discount factors and annuity factors at two percent discount rate so just copy and i'm just copying this formula i don't need to write the formula again just make the changes to the rate two percent two percent that's it no need to recalculate it again just copy this formula here and just change it from five percent to two percent that's it so present values at two percent one into 108 now 3.8 into six now most of the students they may make, make a mistake in exam pressure by just simply multiplying this rate with the discounted cash flow do not multiply it with the discounted cash flow you have to multiply this enmity factor with this cash flow to find out the present value 1.924 into 100 that's it and let us now calculate npv now it's positive 7.73 so let's calculate irr this irr is basically the rate of return from the investor's perspective but from the company's perspective it is the cost of debt because the investor is getting it 
and the company is paying it that's why we are calling it cost of debt from a company's perspective but IRR from the investors perspective so I'm no more calling it IRR I'm calling it cost of debt because we are calculating it for the company but the formula will be the same as of IRR so the lower rate which is 2% plus the positive NPV which is 7.7 7.23 divided by the positive NPV minus the negative NPV and then we have to multiply it by the difference of the higher rate and the lower rate in this way we will get IRR and this is IRR from the investors perspective and cost of debt from the company's perspective the company is effectively paying 3.86 percent return to its investors now a very interesting thing is the interest rate was six percent after tax by the way this is also after tax this will be called as after tax so the after tax interest rate was six percent whereas the cost of debt is 3.86 we are paying six percent interest to our investors but still we are saying that we are paying 3.86 percent do you people know the reason why we are saying we are paying 3.86 percent to our investors whereas the interest is six percent why do we still say that we are paying 3.86 percent to our investors despite paying a higher interest the effective rate is 3.86 percent why is that so why do you think that's the case don't you people think that uh, the cost of debt should have been at least six percent as this is what we are paying to our investors no answer okay let me explain it let me explain it on one hand we are paying our investors six percent after tax interest right this is what we are paying at at one end but on the other hand just look at what is happening on the day of redemption we have received 108 from our investors but after four years we are just paying them hundred dollars so we are deducting this eight additional dollars from their investment so on one hand we are paying them six dollars every year on the other hand we are subtracting this eight dollar from their investment so the net cost to the company will be less than six dollar because of this difference 108 negative and 100 positive we're not paying them what they have invested we are paying less than what they have invested which is effectively reducing our cost of debt that's the that's the reason why this cost of debt is lower than the interest that we are paying is that clear okay tell me what will be the impact on cost of debt if i increase this redemption value what will be the impact on cost of debt if i increase the redemption value let's see 102 yeah it has increased 4.29 percent and what will happen if i increase it to 105 it's 4.92 percent now and what will happen if i increase it to 108 it has increased further 5.51 percent and if i increase to 112 it will be more than six percent now it's more than the interest right 
this is how it goes. I hope it's clear. Okay, we only have 12 minutes left. And uh, instead of going for further questions, since you people have access to this file, I would ask, I would request you people to go through the questions of these, this file so that uh, tomorrow when we'll be going through these questions, we will only be going through the questions that you people were not able to solve. So try this question at home. It will be more effective that we focus only on those questions that you people were not able to solve after attempting. And uh, in the last 10 minutes, now I'll just ask you people if you have any queries, if there's anything that you have come across your textbook or come across any definition or any word or any uh, other thing that you've come across and you, you were not able to understand, you have 10 minutes uh, to ask me. We will be solving MCQs related to business valuation tomorrow. And uh, besides solving the business valuation questions uh, we will also try to go through few as well PNP, I guess it's a it's a question related to receivable management, right? Shiroz uh, probably will be starting working capital tomorrow, but uh, we will just be starting it, and I'll I'll try my level best to uh, solve maximum number of questions for working capital. Rukaiya uh, is asking, sir, can you please explain sales to networking capital ratio? Yeah, sales to networking capital ratio is just telling you how much you have invested in your working capital. And uh, by comparing your sales to your networking capital ratio, you are actually uh, relating your sales to your cap working capital investment. And in case uh, you have higher level of sales compared with your net capital ratio, that is one of the indications of over trading. So if you have more sales than your working capital investment, sometimes it may be alarming for the business to have more sales with very less working capital. Please, with the first question we saw under cost of play, I did not get. You got, uh, Michael. Uh, the figure was nine sixty thousand, which was actually dollars, and then we multiplied it by hundred to convert it into cents. Did you get it, Michael? The question has given us a figure in dollars, 960,000. Yeah.
Yeah, why not? Sir, could you explain the cost of capital sensitivity analysis? Yes, why not? Now, you know that NPV can, NPV can also change. It was there in the question, Michael. Here we go. This is the figure, 960,000. Okay. Uh, Hamad asked me a question. It's a very good question. I want you people to hold your questions uh, before I answer, till I answer the question of Hamad, which is a very good question, a very helpful one for all of you. Uh, sensitivity with the cost of capital means that uh, as you all know that uh, if your cost of capital changes it will also change net present value and uh, if the cost of capital increases the npv will fall and if it further increases it will further reduce the npv and there will be a point where npv will be zero right let's say for example at a 10 percent cost of capital let's say our cost of capital is 10 percent at the moment right but at this cost of capital we have a positive npv we have a positive npv we have a positive npv right so and let's say we increase this cost of capital we increase this cost of capital to say 16% the NPV turns out to be zero. Let's say the NPV turns out to be zero, right? And if I increase it further, it will be negative. So I cannot increase it beyond this limit. I cannot increase this cost of capital beyond. I cannot afford to increase this cost of capital beyond this 16% as it will result in a negative NPV. So that's the maximum change we can afford, right? So what do you think? What is this 16% called? Who's going to tell me? what is this 16 percent called if i get an npv of zero at this rate what is this npv call, this rate called that's irr right yeah that's irr okay at this rate if our cost of capital increases from 10 percent to 16 percent our npv will be zero right so if i know the irr of a project if I know the IRR of the project, I can easily find out the maximum change in my cost of capital that we can afford. In this question, it is the it is 16%. I cannot I cannot have a cost of capital more than 16% for this question. Now, if the current cost of capital is 10%, and somebody asks me how much increase can I afford in this cost of capital, there are two ways of telling. One is telling them in points the percentage points in percentage points it's just six percent points so we can say that from the current level of cost of capital we can only afford an increase of six points six percentage points and the other way of calculating it is in the form of percentage that what that's what we do usually in case of sensitivity analysis that's not a percentage that's a percentage point percentage will be when we ignore the percentage sign just ignore the percentage sign how much change is this in how much change is there in these two figures ignoring the percentage sign what's the difference between the two it's six so a six point increase a six point increase in this 10 will result in a zero npv so six is what percent of 10 six is what percent of 10 it's 60 percent so we will say a 60 percent increase in our cost of capital 
from 10 to 16 it's a 60 percent increase a 60 percent increase in our cost of capital will make our npv zero and that's called the sensitivity of the project towards cost of capital so never say six percent it's not a six percent change if you have a pocket money of ten dollars and then it increases to sixteen dollars you will never say it's a six percent change you will always say it's a sixty percent change so from ten to sixteen it's a sixty percent change so it's a sixty percent so you will always have to say the sensitivity is sixty percent so maybe most of the students they just simply say it's six percent which is wrong Hamad, it was your question i guess is that clear so whenever you are required to find out the sensitivity of the project towards the cost of capital firstly you need to find out the IRR. And then you have to perform this calculation. So the time is over. And uh, I hope today's session was useful. And if you can just quickly give me your feedback. How was today's session? Did it meet your expectations? Was it useful? And if there's any negative feedback I will, I will i will welcome it as well Sure, Afrasia, I, I add theory as well. Thank you, Tasmia. Okay, uh, good night everyone and talk to you people tomorrow. Bye.